Hello, and welcome to the One Ascent Market Update for Q3 2022. My name is Cole Pearson. I serve as President of Investment Solutions here at One Ascent. We are grateful to be with you and delighted that you would invest your time with us today. I'm joined by Nathan Willis, our Director of Portfolio Strategy. Nathan leads our multi-asset solutions group, including our manager selection and our asset allocation committee. Nathan brings over 25 years of investment experience. Prior to joining our team at One Ascent, he served as Chief Investment Officer of Greenhawk Capital and 15 years with Spring Family Offices prior to that. Um, he served in a number of analyst and portfolio management roles after receiving his bachelor's degree from Taylor University. Before I turn it over to Nathan, I'd like to give just a quick overview of One Ascent Investments, our process, and how that fits into the big picture of, of what we're doing here at One Ascent. One Ascent Investments was formed in 2017. We actually celebrated our five-year anniversary earlier this February, and that means that many of our strategies now have a five-year track record. Our team has grown as well. Over the past few years, we're on the investment side, now 11 team members strong, and over 40 across all of One Ascent. Uh, as, a, as a group, we average about 16 years of industry experience and collectively manage just over $700 million in assets under advisement. We primarily serve financial advisors, faith-based organizations, and institutional clients. That includes pension and retirement plans. In terms of our process, uh, values-based investing is core to everything that we do. But I want to first explain our approach to values-based investing. And it begins with a fundamental belief that business particularly for-profit business, is one of the most powerful engines that the Lord has given us to impact uh, the world. And so we believe business impacts people and places, every single person and every square inch. Now, we've developed a framework to, uh, to catalog, categorize, and identify uh, how business is touching each of those groups, the employees, the customers, the suppliers that a business works with, the natural environment, the local community, and society at large. But impact uh, can be positive or negative. So not only do we need a way to categorize these things, we also need a way to assess whether that impact is positive or negative. And so we developed a simple uh, process or, or simple kind of acronym here to understand three E's. Uh, first, to do that, we eliminate companies whose products or practices cause harm. We simply want to take those off the table and avoid them in our investable universe. Uh, but number two is evaluate. Uh, at the end of the day, we are investing, and so we need to identify and evaluate companies uh, that meet our investment objectives, whatever strategy that may be. Uh, but lastly is elevate. We believe that's the other side of the values-based investing coin. It's not simply enough to identify what we will not invest in. At the end of the day, we are, in fact, investing. And so elevate is how we identify companies who make the world a better place and where we actually want to deploy that capital uh, that we are investing on behalf of our clients. So that's just a quick high-level view of, of values-based investing and how we approach it at One Ascent. Um, with what's going on in the markets uh, so far through the first half of this year, we also want to share a little bit about our process for how we navigate the ups and the downs of the market. And so uh, here I'll begin to kind of build that out with just a quick visual. Uh, number one is a strategic view. Part of our investment philosophy is long-term. And so the strategic view is the roadmap. This is where we're trying to get to. If you're a client working with a financial advisor, you set out your goals based on uh, your unique needs, and that determines the roadmap. The strategic allocation is set annually. It's determined by our capital market assumptions, and its goal in the portfolio is to give you risk-based market exposure. Now, this is what differentiates a growth-oriented portfolio from a conservative-oriented portfolio, and that's unique to each client. But around that, we have the tactical or in our case, the navigation. It's what allows us to adjust course on this journey uh, as you're working today to achieve your financial goal. For us, the way we think about the navigation and our navigator process, which will Nathan will unpack in just a moment, uh, is it's updated monthly. We think of it as an objective assessment of the health of global markets. And its goal in the portfolio is what we call behavioral alpha, or really risk mitigation. This portion of the portfolio when we put those together, it sits around the strategic, and its goal is to help you stick to your plan. Uh, one of the largest risks that an investor faces is not sticking to their plan. And so our tactical solution, our tactical overlay, allows us to navigate, again, both the ups and the downs of the market. We're going to spend the balance of our time together today focusing on our allocation committee update and outlook, 
for Q3 2022, led by Nathan Willis, our Director of Portfolio Strategy. Nathan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Cole. It's great to be here, and it's good to talk to everybody. Today, we're going to talk about three things primarily. First, we're going to review the markets in the second quarter. Uh, second, we're going to go through our navigator process and establish what our investment outlook is. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about what actions I should be taking in my portfolio. Throughout all of this, there's going to be one theme uh, that I'm going to come back to, and that theme is, uh, is it getting worse? Uh, and what happens when it stops getting worse? We're going to think about that in terms of the market, we're think about that in terms of inflation, and we're going to think about that in terms of um, the economy. So let's jump in and start looking at the performance numbers first. What I did here is I created a heat map. Uh, for each column, the green, the darkest green uh, cell is the best performer. And the darkest red is the worst performer. And the reason I did that is because the performance this year has been in stark contrast to the performance over the last three and five years. You can see here the three lines on the top are the Russell 1000 growth, so large cap growth stocks, then the S&P 500, which is dominated by large cap growth stocks, and then the Russell mid cap growth, which is again, growth stocks. And you can see, this is where all the problems have come about this year. But looking at the last three and five years, so two and a half years more than this year, or four and a half years more than this year, those performance numbers were fantastic. So it's really, really stark uh, that this is a big contrast to what we've had in the past. The second thing that I would really point out here is the bond returns on the bottom line in the left. Um, they're the best returns for the year, uh, but they're still negative. Uh, in fact, uh, year to date, the overall bond market through the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond uh, Index is down over 10%. Uh, and that's a really bad return. In fact, uh, when you pair bonds with stocks in a balanced portfolio, uh, this is actually a really, really bad return. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at that uh, in picture form and talk about it. So what we have here is a chart you may not have seen before, but this chart takes every year from 1997 through this year, uh, and it starts at one, so it's one dollar invested on January 1st, and then each line goes throughout the year, and it ends on December 31st, and you can see most of the time you end up with a dollar again, you're flat, to up 20 percent with a dollar 20, right? Every now and then you make a a lot of money, and then every now and then you lose a lot of money. But for the most part, um, you're moving forward and making money. But let's look at 2022. This is actually the worst start we have had in the history of the data for a balanced portfolio, for a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. Uh, this is the worst start we've ever had to the first half of the year. So let's compare this year to some other crisis periods. First of all, the pandemic um, in 2020, the stock market and the bond market sold off pretty quickly and pretty hard, but then came back really quickly uh, and ended the year in the positive. The 2001 and 2002 years of the tech bubble, the 2001 is the dark blue, uh, and you can see you were down at one point 12 or 13% during the year, and you finished the year down 5% uh, or so, and then that performance repeated itself again uh, in 2002, and you know you bottomed out there. Uh, that light blue line bottomed out at about October of 2002, which was essentially the end of the tech bubble. Then finally, the global financial crisis. You can see that in 2008, the dark green line uh, had a really, really bad loss, uh, and then in 2009, you started off with a really bad loss again, but then the market came coming back uh, pretty strong and finished the year with a, with a really good return. So it's really important to understand <laughs> that you're not alone uh, in being frustrated with year's return, this year's returns. It was a really bad year, the worst year we've ever had so far for the first two quarters of the year. So what I wanna do now is shift gear a little bit and think about what happens if it's done getting worse, okay? So what happens if it's gonna get better from here? And so what we did is we looked at all these periods. These are the worst six month return periods that we've had. And they're the same periods and the same color coding that we're looking at here. But this time what we're doing is we're saying whenever it bottomed out, that was day zero. And you put a dollar in the market on that day. And what if you held it for the next 365 days? So the following year after it bottomed out when it stopped getting worse. Again, the dark line uh, is 2001, but it is it begins at the six months ending September of 2001. 
Uh, that year following the bottom, you were basically flat. So you made money and then you lost it again and you ended up with a dollar. But then the following year, you made about 25%. And then the other three periods, both of the periods in the global financial crisis and last uh, crisis during 2020 pandemic, you made about 40%. So it's really, really important for us to remember that even though it's really bad, when it stops getting bad, you can make really, really good money. So the question is, is it done getting bad? Uh, is it gonna get worse? So in order to frame that, we're gonna look at our navigator. This is our process which guides us and it uh, consists of four pieces, the valuation piece, the economy, technicals and market sentiment. And we're gonna go through each one of them and we're gonna spend a little bit more time on the economy and on technicals and sentiment, but we have to talk about valuations first. So we're gonna start with bonds. Um, and what we have here is three sets of bond yields. The bottom one, the blue line is the 10 year treasury. And this is a five year chart. And you can see that right now it's yielding almost 3%. And that's really significant, I think, because the Federal Reserve's long-term target for inflation is two and a half percent. So if the Fed meets its long-term goal over the next 10 years, you'll make money on a real basis with the risk-free asset. Uh, that hasn't been the case for the last year or two because uh, yields were below what we all expected inflation would be. Uh, so that change is important. Bonds have become more attractive. Then when you move into corporate bonds, they've become more attractive as well. The red line is investment-grade corporate bonds, and the green line is high-yield corporate bonds. And you can see for each of those, you're getting paid more than you would have gotten paid at any other time in the last three or four years, except the depth of the pandemic crisis when things were really, really bad. So I think that you're getting really paid pretty well um, for the risk you're taking in the bond market today. And so that's a really big change and it's worth, uh, it's worth paying attention to that. Well, let's talk about stocks. We've shown this chart before and it shows uh, large cap stocks uh, by the S&P 500 in red mid cap stocks, the S&P 400 in blue and small cap stocks in green. We've talked about the fact that stocks have gotten cheaper over time and that really accelerated in the second quarter of the year. Um, what's most important on this chart, I think, is to note that mid cap and small cap stocks are about as cheap as they've been in 20 years outside of the depth of the global financial crisis. That's really important to, to think about. Um, for large cap stocks, this is a little bit cluttered. So we're gonna take another look uh, and we're also gonna go five years further back. So this is a 25 year look at just the S&P 500. And you can see here, it has kind of come back to average, right? So it's uh, back to the average. Um, and so, you know, you feel pretty good about that. Uh, not incredibly positive because a lot of times when it comes back to average, it goes further, right? Uh, but if we look at several different measures, outside of just the forward PE ratio, uh, we won't go through all these in detail, but all of them say the market is not too overvalued and not too undervalued, it's somewhere near average. The one thing that I will say is important about uh, stock valuations is these are based upon the forward PE ratio. So they're based on the price today of the index and the earnings that are gonna happen over the next year. One of the things we're watching very closely is whether earnings are actually gonna come through. Earnings. Uh, we're on a tear last year, and we knew there would be a pause or a pullback this year. And as long as earnings don't get too negative, as long as they stay positive, uh, we're going to be okay. But it's something we're watching very closely. So all this leads us to have a neutral look at valuation. Uh, and that's important because we've been negative on valuation for quite some time, a couple years. Uh, but let's talk about the economy. So to talk about the economy, we're going to talk about inflation first, and then we're going to talk about the potential for a recession. So I thought we'd have a little fun talking about inflation, and we would look at the inflation that's in your morning coffee. Um, so this is a picture of the typical supply chain for coffee, whether it comes from South America, Central America, Africa, or East Asia. Um, this is what happens. The first thing to note is it's actually a really complicated supply chain. There are a lot of steps here. This is one of the things that has made uh, the supply chain issue such a big issue, and it's why it's contributed to inflation. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to simplify it a little bit. There's really kind of four pieces of this supply chain. First, you have growing and processing. Second, you have importing and shipping it. 
Then you have the retailing and roasting process, and then finally uh, we get to enjoy our coffee. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this supply chain picture off, and we're going to look at the sources of inflation that we've talked about, okay? And then we're going to talk about how those have impacted each part of the supply chain. So the first uh, source of inflation has been Fed policy. The Fed has uh, had very easy money policies, and that has driven up um, uh, inflation uh, because the excess supply of money flowing through the system. The second and third are really kind of one, and it's COVID and the supply chain. So when I'm talking about COVID, I'm talking more about uh, our lives here in the U.S., uh, you know, being on lockdown, not traveling as much. And then when I talk about the supply chain, that relates primarily to outside of the U.S. products getting here, but then also when they're here, uh, that coffee being shipped to us. And then finally, um, the Ukraine war. Uh, this obviously uh, is a horrible humanitarian tragedy. It's something we all need to be thinking about, um, whether we can help out uh, from a humanitarian point of view. But from the investment standpoint, um, this is primarily affecting us through higher energy prices. So let's look at this and think about the different parts of the supply chain and how are things affecting it. Well, as I said, the Fed policy uh, of easy money has affected all parts of the supply chain, so we won't really dwell on that. COVID then has affected importing and retailing through uh, both um, supply chain costs, um, supply chain hiccups, you know, lack of uh, workers in the supply chain, um, and then here in the U.S., uh, staffing issues, right? People have not wanted to leave their house to work and so it's cost more to hire employees. Um, COVID didn't really affect our consumption, uh, or at least not in an inflationary way, but the supply chain still made coffee more scarce for us, and so that drove up uh, inflation a little bit. Uh, and then finally, uh, energy prices driven by the war in Ukraine has really affected uh, primarily the importing and retailing portions of the supply chain. So this is all fun to look at, but there's a reason. The reason I'm showing you this is that I wanted to share which parts of this are not getting worse, right? Where are these inflation pressures easing? So let's look at that. Really, everywhere except the war in Ukraine is easing. The only other place I would say that's not necessarily easing is the uh, work shortage, uh, workforce shortage uh, at the retail level. Um, I think that maybe have, has, has been a uh, transition that was uh, accelerated by COVID. And so um, employee costs are still, I think, you know, a good bit higher than prior to COVID. But if we kind of synthesize all of this together and move it off to the side, how is this affected the price of coffee? So here's a chart. Uh, and as you can see, this is a five-year chart. Coffee really ran up, even starting in 2021. Um, but then you can see now in 2022, it's beginning to moderate, right? It's not as bad as it was, okay? And that's really where we're focused on. As long as these markets are not getting as bad as, uh, uh, as bad as they have been getting, we're going to be okay. So let's look at broad commodity prices. This is a grouping of three different charts. The first one is the energy complex. The second one is the metals complex, primarily industrial metals. And then finally, we have agricultural. This, again, is a heat map, but it's horizontal. So uh, as you go over to the right, you see the uh, cells getting yellow and then more red. That means higher prices. So the red is higher prices. And so if you look, uh, 1231 of 18, 2018, 2019, 2020, we just look at the end of the year. Uh, but then in, uh, towards the end of 2021, prices started to increase. And then they really, really accelerated uh, in the first quarter of 2022. But if you look in the second quarter, uh, at June 30th, you can start to see that some of these prices are moderating. So again, what we think of is uh, these are not getting worse, right? So uh, when this is not getting worse, that means inflation is going to come down, uh, and it's not going to be the problem that it has been. Uh, so we're hanging our hat on that a little bit, but it looks by all accounts that in inflation is beginning to moderate. So then the next piece of the economy that we want to look at is a recession, the potential for a recession. As we've talked about uh, throughout this year and I've written about, uh, inflation was the big problem in the market size, and then that shifted to a recession. So I realized, as I was thinking about this, uh, that there's been a ton written and spoken about recessions, probably actually too much. And so really what we're going to do is we're going to focus on one quote. Um, the stock market has predicted nine of the past five recessions. So think about that. Uh, 
what that means is the stock market tends to overreact. And that makes sense because the stock market is emotional. And so uh, the stock market, having predicted nine of the past recessions, uh, what we want to do then is we want to say, well, what if this recession, if we're in a recession now, what if it's not as bad as the market thinks? Because the stock market has been really bad this year, and it's really pricing in a recession. It's probably pricing in a mild recession based upon what most people think. So if we don't have a recession, that's great for the stock market. Even if we do have a recession, that's probably okay because we're already having a recession in our portfolio. Really, the only problem would be is if we have a bad recession. And I think one of the key things that would impact that is earnings again. So earnings are still holding up. Earnings estimates are not declining. Uh, and as long as earnings hold up, uh, we're going to think of the economy as neutral. There's a potential for it to be negative, but at this point, it's still neutral. So let's talk about technicals. You know, we've talked a lot about what happens if it's not getting worse. And the technicals are some of the things that can point us to that, to say, look, maybe we're near a bottom in the stock market. So let's look at some of the signs that the market is near a bottom. So not this chart, but this line uh, is one that Bob Dahl talked about uh, in the beginning of our year uh, conference call. And the blue line is the S&P 500. And the yellow line here is the advanced decline line. And that's a me measure of market breadth. And so what that line takes is it says the number of stocks are going up minus the number of stocks that were going down. And so coming out of the pandemic, you had rising breadth where the advanced decline line was going up. But Bob in January rightly noted that the advanced decline line had been steady. So market breadth wasn't increasing at the same time the stock market was. And at the time, that was a risk, right? Um, because you would want to see breadth to continue being positive when the market is positive. Well, it didn't happen. The market declined and breadth declined. But what we're seeing now is that breadth is stabilizing. So this gives us the indication that maybe we're in a, in a bottoming process and maybe it won't get much worse than this. Um, so that's something that we really like to see. And if indeed we are in a bottoming process, long-term is a really good time to be putting money to work in both stocks and bonds. So this is very important for us to pay attention to. Another sign that we look at is just the number of new lows. So number of 52 week lows in the stock market. You can see back in March of 2020, uh, that really spiked during the pandemic. And you saw it also spike uh, the beginning of this year. It was a little bit different data because we were, the market was, was still at a high for a portion of that period. But you can see here in June, we had um, a pretty big increase and that has come down. So one of the things we wanna see that we're not quite there yet on is that we want to see that number continue to drop. Um, that'll help give us a sense that the market is in a more positive trend. So uh, the first one, uh, the market breadth, tells us maybe we're at a bottom. And then this one can maybe tell us we're at a bottom and we're establishing a new trend up. So uh, all in all, when we look at the technicals, we think that's um, relatively neutral, uh, not tremendously positive or tremendously negative. So one of the other things we look at uh, is market sentiment. And we've looked at this chart a lot. This is the American Association of Individual Investors Sentiment Survey. And last week, uh, there was 27% bullish, 26%, 26.9, and 46.5% bearish. So if you look at that, only half as many people were bullish as were bearish. And that ratio is important. Um, you've seen for the last quarter, the green line on the right, the percent bullish has been hovering around 20 or in the low 20s, below 30 for quite some time. And that to us is a real positive thing because it means all the people who want to sell have probably sold and there's not that much more bearishness to go around. Uh, so in the end, this probably means uh, we're going to have another, uh, another solid market going forward. One of the things we like to think about here is um, investment quotes from uh, well-known investors. And so let's go back to um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway's chairman's letter from 1986. This is a quote that's become relatively famous. And what he said back then is, we simply attempt to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy only when others are fearful. And you can make the case that right now, investors are very fearful. So it does make sense to be greedy, it makes sense to be wise about it, but it makes sense to be greedy. Let's also frame this in a much longer time frame. This next chart uh, goes back 15 years before the financial crisis, 
and you see on the top the S&P 500, and the number on the bottom is the percentage of bulls divided by the percentage of bears, the ratio we were just looking at. And so if I put a line down here where we are, where we are right now is about half, right? We're about half bulls relative to bears, but earlier in the year, it got as low as a third. Uh, at one point in uh, April, I think it was about a third as many bullish as bearish investors. And if you look, the last time it was that low was in the depth of the global financial crisis in February of 2009, which was within a month or so of the bottom, uh, major bottom of the stock market. So to us, this sentiment reading as a contrary indicator gives us another piece of data that says maybe we're near a bottom and we should start thinking about getting a little bit more aggressive in our portfolios. And so I know it was a little bit boring, but uh, with a bunch of neutral, uh, but with market sentiment, we can view this as positive. So with all of this in our head, what should we do about it? Um, what do you want to do in this market? So here's some advice I will give. The first is I want to talk about pitfalls to avoid. And the first one is emotions. So what we want to be doing uh, in this kind of a market is reviewing, reviewing your plan and remember the long-term plan, right? Uh, we think you should consider alternative investments if volatility is a problem. You shouldn't jump out of the market and buy alternatives now, but you should start thinking about it. Uh, and I want you to evaluate your risk tolerance in partnership with your advisor. It's really important to have an advisor uh, partnering with you in your journey. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, why not to follow emotions. This is a chart we pulled. A lot of people talk about missing the 10 best days of the market and the 20 best days in the market. Well, I actually don't think those are as valuable because oftentimes the worst day of the market is the day before or the day after one of the best days in the market. We saw that during the pandemic. You had down 11% one day and up 10% the next. So what I did is I wanted to look at the 10 best months. Uh, and I think there's some value uh, to, to be seen here. And so the blue line here is the S&P 500 return. So this is since January 1st of 2000, and you see you made three times your money over that time period, which is really good. But if you miss the 10 best months, so that's just one month every other year over the last 22 years, not even quite every other year, uh, you would have only earned about 20% on your money. So you, you lost a ton of return if you missed the best month. But then if you look at the chart to the right that shows those 10 best months, what can you see? you can see that oftentimes these best months occur during bear markets and usually at the end, right? So you can see uh, the very bottom one is March of 2000. That was the beginning of a bear market or right before, but October of 02 was the very end of the tech bear market. Uh, March and April of 09 were the, were the two first months following the global financial crisis. And then you can see April of 2020, uh, was another huge month. So it's very important to remain in the market and not to make an emotional decision to get out of the market. Likewise, don't panic. You know, remember that volatility happens and that you should remain in it, uh, in the market rather, during volatility. If you have some cash on the side, you should dollar cost average into the market if it meets your goals. Um, also, this is a sensible time to take advantage of tax loss harvesting opportunities. So this chart I'm going to show to make this point is a chart that we've all seen a lot. But this is the average calendar year return uh, in the bar. And then the red dots are every year what the worst intra-year decline was. And you can see this year is 24%. Um, and so this is a bad year. It's one of the, one of the worst five or 10 years. Uh, but remember, volatility happens. And it's something that we can take advantage of if we're very, very sensible. So this is some advice for what I think you should do. So let's talk about what we at one Center are doing for you. The first thing we're doing is maintaining discipline. You might have guessed that given how I've talked. Uh, we have a slightly elevated level of cash in the bond portion of our portfolios that we're in the process of uh, putting back to work. Uh, but our stock weighting is right at its long-term asset allocation target. So you are right in line with where you should be long-term. This year, we've done a couple of modest shifts to protect against inflation and to help us with volatility, but we haven't made any huge moves. Um, what we're thinking about in the future though, we're evaluating portfolios. As I detailed throughout this call, we're watching sentiment and technical factors very carefully. And what we're looking to do uh, is that we're looking to increase our high yield bond allocation and we're looking to increase our stock allocation if those opportunities present themselves. So then when we look at this through the lens of our asset allocation, 
we see our five primary asset allocations uh, listed here, but I'm going to focus on our moderate allocation, which targets a 60% equity allocation. You can see we are right at 60%, so we are neutral on our asset allocation. And you can see at the very bottom, we have just a little bit of cash. 10% uh, of our bond allocation is in cash waiting to be reinvested. So we are neutral, and we look forward to serving you again in the future. So I will pause here and turn it back to Cole to finish off the call. Great, thank you, Nathan. A lot of ground to cover, um, and you can see um, for our audience and attendees, uh, a lot of work uh, that we do on your behalf, uh, thinking through valuation, the economy, technical sentiment, and how we process that on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, and an annual basis. Um, we really, really wanna thank you for your time uh, today. If you'd like to learn more about our solutions uh, or, or about speaking with an advisor, you can visit us at investments.wanacent.com or email us at info at .com. Some of what we have captured in this call today can also be found in other resources. Uh, we have our allocation dashboard, fact sheets on each of our strategies and weekly and monthly investment commentary um, that we would love to share with you. Um, that can be found on our website, on our normal social media channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, and even YouTube. Uh, we'd always be happy to, to talk with you on the phone. Thank you for uh, your time. We value that and for the fact that you invested that with us today. Um, this will conclude our call, and we look forward to speaking with you again uh, in Q4. Thanks, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.